Today we have Dr. Erica Thomas. She is a consulting associate at Charles River Associate, a global consulting firm. She earned her PhD in plant and microbial biosciences at Washington University in St. Louis. And a B is in molecular genetics from the Ohio State University. Welcome, Erica. And then we have Carl Kuo. He is a senior investigator in genetics at GlaxoSmithKline. He earned his PhD in human genetics and genomics from Duke University. And a B is in biomedical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. Thank you for joining with us, with us Carl. And then we have Bauer Nockwain. She is a biomedical engineer at the FDA and has prior experience as a science and technology policy cons consultant and a fellow in California State Senate Health Committee. She received her PhD and BS in bioengineering at the University of Maryland. Thanks for joining with us, Pao. We are very excited for this fascinating opportunity to learn from all of you. So to start with, it will be very interesting to know from each one of you, very briefly, why you chose non-academic field. So let's start with you, Bao. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so happy to be here. It's, uh, nice to see everyone else on the panel. Um, the reason why I didn't go into quote unquote traditional uh, careers after my PhD, and I, I really don't like having the um, non-traditional, traditional label, I think, because I think nowadays a lot of things are not academic related. And so I didn't go into academia after my PhD because I think after probably my third, probably towards the end of my third or fourth year of my PhD, I realized, wow, like research is very tiring. It's a lot of work and it's more tedious <laughs> than I wanted my life to be. And so academia was just not something I, uh, saw myself doing long term. Um, so I still like research, but I just didn't think that that was going to be a uh, career for me to do as a um, either long time researcher or a PI somewhere. So I decided to venture out elsewhere um, and not go the traditional PhD route. Thank you, Val. Now moving to you, Carl. So I also knew that I wanted to do research after my PhD. But the reason why I chose uh, GSK and pharma is that I want to do something that was closer to the patients, right? So I know that when we were publishing, you always, your final conclusion of all your papers, you always write and blah, blah, blah. This can potentially be used to help patients in the future develop therapeutics. But I actually wanted to do that. So that's why I chose to go to uh, pharma. That's very interesting. Thank you, Carl. Now let's know from Erica what's her story. Hi guys, um, so pretty similar to Bao actually. Um, so uh, as was mentioned, I did my PhD in plants and microbial biology. And while I, I did like the research, I thought bench research was a little bit tedious for my liking, um, but I wanted to continue on with research. Um, so now I am focusing on uh, market research within the consulting sphere and it's still focused on life sciences so I can still use my science background. Thank you, Erica. So uh, I have a list of questions that was submitted during registration. So I will be posing them to our panelists and open the floor for discussion. But before I go through the list, uh, if there are any questions from trainees and students, just let us know in the chat section and we will ask you to unmute yourself and go ahead with your question. So let's get right into it with our first question for the panelist. And so, why would, what would you recommend the students and training to do to ease into exploring non-academic career option? I mean, how one can, ex one can begin to learn about new sectors? Well, I think we have something from Annie, by the way, that asks if, for us to explain what, our, what we do on our job. Yeah, yeah go ahead with it. Oh, okay, we'll just go, I'll, I'll start real quick. So um, basically I'm a computational biologist and a, statistical geneticist, and I lead a small group of scientists to really leverage genetic evidence to support all stages in the pipeline. And I also interact with the business development folks. So you may have heard our big collaboration with 23andMe, right? So it's not just driven by the science, but it's also driven by the business prospects and what that could potentially bring for GSK. 
Yeah, I can hop in and go next. Um, so my official title is a consulting associate. Um, and what my day to day looks like um, is I'm uh, on multiple different projects with um, pharmaceutical companies as well as uh, medical device manufacturing companies. And what we do is mostly focused around commercial strategy. So say, for example, you have a medical device company that's like, I'm really interested in going into surgical robotics. Like, how should we do this? Do some interviews, collect some data, analyze the data from physicians and make a recommendation as to how we should enter this particular field, right? So there is still a technical aspect of it and it's, it's actually like research, but it's uh, much easier to gather the data. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, and I'm a biomedical engineer at the FDA. I'm a reviewer there. So what that means is I work on the pre-market side. So any companies um, that want to get their product out to the market uh, have to apply to the FDA. So I work specifically in the cell therapy um, arena. And so I got my PhD in um, bioengineering. And so I have a lot of experience in stem cell science. And so the field, the group that I work in reviews a lot of stem cell products that try to go to the market. And so before they go to market, they have to um, apply to us for clinical trial authorization. And so we review all of this information that they collect um, on their research side to see if we think it would be safe to be used in humans. And so similar to Erica, I like that I get to see cutting edge science and kind of review cutting edge science without actually having to do it myself. <laughs> That's kind of the, the best part is that I still get to be involved. I still get to read papers and do all that without actually having to do the bench um, work that's related to it. And I still feel like I'm having an impact by allowing um, really important and useful products to eventually make it to the market if they are proven to be safe and effective. That's interesting to know. Okay, so now let's uh, move back to the question that I asked. What would you, so let me re repeat the question again. What would you recommend the students and trainee to do to ease into exploring non-academic career options? Um, I can go first. Um, at least I can tell you from experience of what I did. And so I knew that I didn't want to do academia, like I said, during my third or fourth year. And so um, I really got interested in like the policy side of things. And I had done kind of some of that for my own hobbies and, and um, activities with the community. And so um, I would definitely suggest if you are interested in something that's not academic, you're going to have to use kind of your off work time to, to look into it because we know how much time research can take up and how much work you have to put towards, you know, finishing your PhD or your graduate degree. And so a lot of that time I spent um, mostly you know, on weekends or other activities, extracurricular activities. Um, but I was really lucky in that I asked my PI at the time, I said, you know, I'm really interested in policy. Um, is there a possibility for me to maybe take off one summer to kind of do research somewhere else or do some something related to policy? And so he allowed me to go to work in a with a um, in a group in D.C. because we were right outside of D.C. So um, a policy and advocacy group in D.C. And so I spent one summer there between my fourth and fifth year of my Ph.D. And so he allowed me to do that. I still had to like work in my papers, but I didn't have to do lab work. Um, so that if that's something that your PI is willing to let you do, I think that's a great opportunity to kind of do a quick internship kind of while you're finishing up your PhD if you know for sure that academia or postdoc is not um, the way you want to go. So yeah, my, my path. Oh, sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> no, you first. Okay. I was just going to mention what you're doing now, everyone here is doing now is exactly what you should be doing. I'll give an example. I was at Duke. Um, a few weeks ago, and I was at Georgia Tech late last year, just talking to students, doing what I'm doing now. A couple of them reached out to me afterwards, and now they have internships. Unfortunately, they were supposed to be on site, but due to COVID, now they're remote interns, but still. The point is, if you just reach out to people, like any of us, uh, I don't know, but certain companies have internships that they can offer. You can get your feet wet and decide if you like it. Yeah, so my, my path was pretty similar as well. I went to graduate school knowing that I didn't want to go into academia and knowing that I wanted to take the industry route. And that's actually one of the reasons why I chose uh, Washington University, because they do have like really strong industry connections and they seem to be um, pretty open to students uh, pursuing paths outside of academia. 
Um, and so while I was at WashU, I think in my second year, so pretty early on, um, I joined a student-run consulting group um, and basically I eventually worked my way up to president of that consulting group. Um, and from that point on, I knew that is what I wanted to do. So in that particular student-run consulting group, uh, we worked with uh, mostly St. Louis-based companies. So you kind of got like a feel for the local community. Um, so you had like a really good network within um, the local biotech community, but also the network that you developed within the group was really valuable. Um, so I, I think like every company that I got an interview at, um, I had a, a connection to um, somebody who I knew was working at that particular company. So it is extremely important to develop your network, but in a high quality way, right? So you, it's, it's one thing to just cold call people all the time, but it's another thing to work with people and show them that you do really high quality work. So they'll always be comfortable referencing you. Yeah, so that was very informative. But as um, um, Erica, Hugh, Carl, and Bob mentioned and suggested, it is better to connect with professionals. So the question is that how can one connect with such professional? Is there any blog or site where um, that can be used for such career transition? Um, not sure of any specific website. I have had people just message me on LinkedIn says, hey, I saw you're a Duke alum in UPGG program. I'm interested in associates. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'm always happy to talk to that. So that's a kind of a cold call, but there's some relationship. And like I said, after these kinds of recruiting events, I usually receive e emails from people, and I'm always happy to respond, right? Part of this is also us representing our companies. They're trying to attract talent. So I wouldn't be afraid to, to talk to us. Yeah, definitely feel yeah. free to, to reach out if this is something that you're interested in. Yeah, for sure, me too. I think um, I work at the FDA and a lot of my former lab mates work at the FDA and I think it's just uh, that, net, that network is only created by you reaching out to people um, and this is one of the greatest opportunities to do it. So definitely if you have um, questions, feel free to email. That would be very useful. So, um, do you have any advice on how to get into industry with only academic experience? Just go for it, I guess. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters like what your thesis is on. I think the if you're a quantitative individual that's that's very structured in in the way that they think and present yourself well, I think that's all that really matters. No one really cares if you studied flies or I don't know in an oncology space. So for me, I didn't really care. I actually explored the consulting area as well and interviewed a few firms um, when I was deciding what to do. So you should always just, just go for it. Do you have anything to say on this, Erica and Bao? Um, yeah, I think that, so I, I made sure that my resume was really tailored to consulting. Um, through, you know, volunteering in this particular student group. Um, but I work with several other individuals who have PhDs um, in fields that really just aren't related to, like, anything applicable. For example, my PhD was in, like, in vitro biochemistry, right? Like, that's, it's, it's just not something that we're going to see pop up in a consulting project. Um, so I, I would say, like, from a consulting perspective, um, they – they're looking for PhDs because you know how to solve problems in a structured way. Um, and I think there are, like a lot of firms are moving towards hiring more PhDs because of that reason. Um, so I don't think you need to uh, really spend a, lo a lot of time making your resume like perfect and, and already look like a consultant. I think that just showing that uh, you had a strong PhD uh, will, will get your foot in the door at least. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I think, um, and the same with what Carl said, our PhD topic really is not going to be relevant in most jobs, you know, unless you're going specifically into research in that particular field. Um, so don't worry about your research thesis being related to whatever you want to go into in the future. It all has to do with you know, having very strong written and communication skills. That That is going to be relevant in, in any job, especially if you want to go non-academic. And so, um, being able to communicate what your research was, but to a lay audience, for example, like those kinds of skills really help 
others understand that you know how to communicate with people outside of science. And so a lot of these jobs, you're going to have to interact with people that are not directly in science or, you know, marketing or, or you know, other uh, parts of industry that are going to have to understand you without um, knowing exactly what your research is about. And so and if you can hone those kinds of skills, I think that will make you um, really marketable for a non-academic uh, research setting. Um, there are a couple questions in the chat, and so one of them is asking, maybe this is more towards Erica, then how long should a resume be for a consulting job? Uh -huh. I guess maybe the, how in-depth should it be? <laughs> the safest answer is a page. We just get a little bit irritated with anything more than a page, to be quite honest. So definitely go the resume route rather than the CV route. That is That is another difference between applying to academic jobs versus consulting jobs. And then um, Annie's asking, and this would be for everyone, I guess, how important was your publication and grant record for getting your jobs? Um, I'll start. So for me, it was, I would say, kind of important because I'm in a actual, like, research research role. So they're, because I'm a senior investigator, they expect me to lead a team, right? So that's really important. And these te the people that I'm leading are all PhD and master's level scientists. Um, I'm also in the field of genetics and statistical genetics. So as you know, pharma's getting involved in this. They expect the person to really have a strong background in that as well. Now, they didn't necessarily say, oh, you have X first author publications. And even when I review resumes, when, when I'm hiring to my group or others, I don't look at that necessarily. But I do expect them to have some kind of publication record that's, that looks reasonable. And for us, the most important skill um, aside from good communication and the, et cetera, is really strong quantitative knowledge, um, some statistics, and also definitely some coding skills. Because nowadays, for a lot of these kind of jobs, uh, just being a bench science doesn't it doesn't cut it. You have to have know some kind of computing language in addition to your bench science. Um, for FDA, I would say that publication record is a small part. It's definitely something um, you should have some publications, but there's no hard number as to how many you should have. I think it just shows that you were productive and were able to publish something. You know, we don't look, really look at you know, impact factor or any of those things. I think it just shows that you know how to write clearly. People want to read your, your, your things and you were productive getting a PhD. I think the interview part ends up being more important just to kind of show again your interpersonal skills, your communication skills, being able to talk about your research, um, having clear communication skills again is a little bit more important than the sheer number of publications that you had. Right, and I think that's actually a little bit different for consulting depending on the firm that you're applying to. So like the larger management firms, I, I don't actually think they have a good idea of what it means to like have a publication in like a really high impact journal, right? Um, but if you're applying to more life science oriented uh, consulting firms, then, you know, P people with PhDs are reviewing your resume and they'll be able to look for the different factors um, that, that show that you had a, a really productive PhD. So um, I, it definitely depends on the firm you're applying to. I think there was kind uh, of a follow-up question. Yeah. What kind of coding language is most commonly used? Python and R. If your statistics use R and everything else, Python. Um, I have another question that uh, I think it might be on on the list, but uh, for those of us, so a lot, there's a chunk of us that are PhD students, and then there's a chunk of us that are po that are postdocs. How um, how much does like the length of your your postgraduate uh, career really play into your ability to get like a non-academic position? Um, do like the postdocs that are further along in their career, do you have any like, specific advice for them? If you're a postdoc, at least coming to, to, to the pharma, you have an advantage, right? Because there are some people that finish their postdocs maybe three, four years, maybe they had a, a short second one and they entered at like a senior investigator or director level. So it can really help you as long as it was a productive postdoc. It, it can't hurt you, certainly. Um, from the consulting perspective, I would say that a postdoc is, is 
pretty unnecessary um, unless you did your postdoc at like a pretty prestigious institution, um, because that is something, unfortunately, that consulting firms look for. Um, I think most of the people who have PhDs at my company came straight from their PhD program and maybe 10% um, did a postdoc, but at a really prestigious institution um, for only a couple of years. The length didn't matter way too much. Um, for FDA, I think a postdoc could be helpful, but it's not required. Many of us <clears throat> went straight from our <clears throat> um, PhDs to the FDA, and so um, unless you're in like a research position, we do have research positions and PIs at the FDA who do um, research, and so for them, it would probably be more helpful to have um, a postdoc, but for review positions, it's not necessary, and so um, if you have one, great. If not, I don't think it puts you at a disadvantage either way. Um, I have another question with this. Um, do you feel like the stressors that you experience as a graduate student, are they similar? Or are they different to the stressors that you've experienced in your current careers? Yes and no, I guess. The stress of how can I put this? There is less consistent stress as working at least at my job. However, the very high points of stress are even worse, I would say, than graduate school for what I do. Because unlike telling your advisor, oh, I need an extra month to finish my paper, you can't tell the chief scientific officer, I need an extra month to get you this result, right? You have to get it done by these deadlines. And there are very hard things that you are evaluated on, right? So. That part gets stressful, but I think on a day-to-day, -day, your general stress level is lower, so it's better. Yeah, I think, uh, so any sort of client-facing position is not for the faint of heart. Um, clients will, but clients are pretty ruthless for to their consulting teams, right? They're like, we need this thing done by this particular date, and we know that you're going to work around the clock to get this done, right? Um, and so my stressors are completely different than what they were in graduate school. I never really experienced um, somebody coming in to me in the morning in, in the lab and saying, this experiment needs to be done by 2 p.m., right? And that consistently happens to me in consulting. It's like I wake up and I'm not sure like what the day is going to throw at me, but like it continuously throws things at me and you have to be very productive. You have to be focused on all the time, knocking out everything um, that comes your way. So. Yeah, just totally different from graduate school for me. Yeah, for me, similar to what has already been said, I think when you're in grad school, you kind of set your own timeline. That's the beauty of doing your own research. You, you know, you have your PI kind of giving you a very rough idea of like, yeah, try to finish, you know, in the next few years. But really, you do it at your own pace and you get as much done as you want and can, obviously. But um, for these jobs, at least at FDA, all of our timelines are, uh, uh, driven by regulation. So a submission comes in from a company, we have only usually 30 days to review it. There's no wiggle room on those 30 days. You just get it done. And so um, that is stressful. Uh, and you juggle lots of different uh, files at a time. So similar to your project in, in your PhD, you probably have your main project and a few side projects, and you have to learn how to juggle those. But when you have very strict deadlines at work now, there's really no wiggle room. You just kind of get it done. So like sometimes, like they said, stress level really high, and sometimes you're managing just fine. But it's a different kind of stress because it's not coming from yourself. It's coming from your bosses upstairs. So that's slightly different. Um, I think there's oh, some I questions think in the chat. Yeah, I see um, Annie was asking if the federal government, since the federal government, government is sometimes hard to break into, is there an advantage or pathway for FDA uh, postdocs to get permanent positions? Now, that's a great question. It is absurdly annoying how to do <laughs> the pathway of getting into government. If I'm sure if you guys have heard of USA Jobs, it's like the main application site to get into, uh, to get into a, a government position. and it's notoriously difficult to get through that like first barrier, which is really just like a computer system and you have to get through. Um, but yes, there are definitely pathways to get um, through the FDA beginning with like a fellowship. So I started as a commissioner's fellowship. Um, that fellowship unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. It 
I was the last year, but there's other fellowships that you can do. So if you're interested in um, getting into the FDA, the O-RISE fellowship is a good one to start out with. And they are combining a bunch of different fellowships, including the one that I was in under a new umbrella. Um, I have to check what the name is. I don't know if they've launched it yet, but I do recommend that those be a easier, quote unquote, way to get into um, the FDA or other types of um, government agencies if there is a fellowship and they usually do convert into a permanent position. So that's what I did. I started out as a commissioner fellow and then I got converted to a permanent position. Um, and so I can send out links to those fellowships that people are interested in after this. Okay, so we have one question from Divya and um, it's, do you anticipate COVID-19 have impact on upcoming hiring cycles? I mean, for FDA, probably, you know, things, we're trying to move things along as much as we can, but obviously everything is lagging a little bit. Um, I know there are people who are in the pipeline of getting hired and maybe they, I'm not even sure if they were allowed to start and if they started, they were remote. So um, I do expect things to be a little bit behind um, and just because everyone's working from home and things are harder to do remotely than uh, in person. Yeah, um, from the consulting perspective, I know that our off cycle candidates have been like their interviews have been postponed. Um, but for anybody who's researched it, you probably know that consulting deadlines are usually in like the late summer, early fall. And so it's kind of like a, an annual deadline for many consulting firms. I can't imagine that it would impact us way too much um, just because I think I see another question on here um do, you know is has it shifted our job roles and projects yes i've actually already had to like take some of my market research surveys and write in um covid questions for the positions right so it's like you know you're you're thinking about prescribing this particular medication do you think the volume will go down because of covid19 and like when do you think that impact is going to end so likely not um to the hiring uh to the hiring question um but yes i've already seen a shift in um our, our projects from this? Yeah, you know, our hiring is not affected at all. Um, we're, we're just doing everything remote. But as far as the number of people we hire and when we want them to start, it's the same. Um, and as far as a shift, yes, because GSK is the largest vaccines company in the world. And so as you can imagine, uh, so there are some projects now that we have uh, that have to do with that vaccine. And also, we just entered a collaboration with Veer. Uh, so to develop vaccines. So yes, very applicable to us. Yes, and as you can probably also imagine, FDA is completely swamped in all aspects <laughs> of uh, affected by COVID, whether it's, you know, making sure testing is getting out, making sure there's some sort of vaccine in the pipeline to try to get developed, other types of treatments and therapies, um, masks, making sure we have enough on the market. I mean, there's, FDA is just, um, yeah, we're all over the map in terms of trying to uh, deal with this COVID-19. We have a question from Morgan. How will you evaluate the anticipation for a job upon PhD graduation? Can you clarify the question, anticipation? Yeah. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. yeah. It's good to be excited. I guess that's good. I don't <laughs> For sure. It's good to brace yourself a little bit, huh? Maybe Morgan yeah. can clarify it if he can turn on his mic. Morgan, can you un unmute yourself and clarify your question, please? Yeah. Uh, so I want to ask that like, if you are trying to find a job, like uh, what kind of job will you anticipate like they will respond to you or and then after you get the job offers, like how how will you anticipate like to join a company or or select a? Okay, I think I understand. So when I apply for jobs, I apply for one of the big three consulting firms. I applied for a couple of pharma companies, and I also applied to be a clinical clinically vetted physician genetics, clinical geneticist, right? So those are three very different tracks, right? So when I apply for all of them, 
I interviewed for all of them, I got offers, and then I sat there and I really thought, okay, what do I want to be in 10 years? So I know the answer to that. Going which path will get me there faster? And then I realized that the clinical genesis, I'll be working with patients face-to-face -face a lot, which is kind of once you're in that space, that's what you do, right? So for me, I'm like, okay, I have to accept the fact that I'm pretty much gonna become a doctor, which is great, right? But if I really want to innovate and lead a team for research, I either have to go to a big three company, then exit that, right? And then go to pharma and be, become a you know, higher level, or I can just work my way up in pharma. Then, I, then you obviously get to consider the location, the pay, the benefits, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, you make what's best for you. So I end up joining GSK. That, that was my process. Yeah, I think mine was a little bit more focused. I kind of just like get really hyper focused on things and decided that I was only going to apply to consulting firms to, for that particular round. Um, and how I made my final decision um, was based off of a combination of the type of work that the different the different firms did. So I also applied to the the big three firms and then also um, some more boutique firms and other life sciences firms. And I made my final decision because um, some, some firms just focus on general management consulting. Um, and so it's not necessarily life sciences projects that you're gonna be focusing on. Um, and other firms just really have a, a terrible work-life balance. So basically like you, a, a lot, several firms, you get on a plane on Monday morning, you live in a hotel Monday to Thursday, you fly back on Friday and work in the regional office on Friday. I, kind, I, I definitely wanted to, uh, stay at home. I, I wanted to live at home. <laughs> um, and so that's, that was another uh, big factor in my decision was kind of like that, that lifestyle decision because consulting can really just turn your lifestyle upside down if you let it. Um, when I applied for jobs, this was in 2016, so not that long ago, but um, I had applied to, I knew I wanted to do policy, so I applied to things at FDA, but I also applied for a couple of kinds of policy fellowships. Um, so I was offered one in California and then a couple of other jobs. And one of the main ones, I was really deciding between an FDA job, similar to the one that I have now at the science policy position in California. And it was the California program was one year long. So um, when I was deciding that, I was like, well, I want to do policy. If I work, my plan was to eventually be at the FDA and work my way up to a policy position within the FDA. Cause it's still science related, but it is policy that I ultimately wanted to do. Um, but decided to go to California for a year to do the fellowship. Um, yes, it was far away. Yes, it was kind of a pain to move across the country for a year, but it was totally worth it. Um, it was an experience that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise in other ways. And so um, you kind of have to think about way, you know, your benefits as to, yes, I have to move across the country away from family for a little while, but is that worth getting experience? The pay is probably not as good as it would have been at FDA, but can I put up with that for a year? So you kind of weigh your options um, to see ultimately what you want to do. And so even that, I took the opportunity in, in California for a year, but it was just worth so much more than I could have gotten just in terms of money or other conveniences. Um, so um, I'm really glad I did that. So I would just suggest applying to as many things that you think you would be interested in, interested in and then see kind of, um, where what you get um, once you have offers and I think someone asked um, how early you should apply before you graduate and so you know a lot of these deadlines are springtime at least for fellowships so springtime of your last year you know you should definitely start applying I know you have lots of things to do with your thesis but look into that for FDA or other government agencies you know that process takes forever. So definitely apply in the springtime before you graduate, maybe in the summer or fall, because it will take that long to get that kind of um, paperwork and things done. So um, FDA at least is willing to work with you on a, on a start date, if, even if you have to push it back a little bit for your thesis. I think there's a question for you, Val, specifically, or maybe you kind of already addressed that. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, can I elaborate on the types of fellowships, internships that would be good first steps in the government work? So I mentioned there's like that ORISE fellowship for PhDs, a postdoc. Um, I can send out a link out to that one. It's O-R-I-S-E, O-R-I-S-E, yeah. Um, look at the ORISE and then um, that one is something that's after your PhD. So it's required that you have finished your PhD before you start that fellowship. Um, I don't really know if we have internships 
for PhD students. There's stuff for post-college um, graduates, but probably not something during your PhD. Um, but yeah, I can send out some links after this for the fellowships at the FDA. Now we have a question from Fabiola, I think. And the question is, how is your work-life balance? Uh, should the consultant kick this one off? Um, <laughs> so uh, I definitely would not recommend consulting if you're looking for the optimal work-life balance career. Um, my firm is actually like one of the better firms in terms of work-life balance for the reasons I mentioned before. We don't really have to travel so much. Like we only really travel for like final client readouts um, or project kickoffs. Um, but I would say... I like very consistently work like 55 to 60 hour weeks within like Monday to Friday. So the nice thing about consulting is your weekend is like almost always protected. Um, and so like you, you get those two days like totally off to sort of re-prepare for the week. But yeah, it's, um, it, it's definitely a lot. I think like a, a normal work day is like eight to six thirty and then again from like eight thirty to ten or one o'clock in the morning depending on what the client needs right um so uh not great but the work is really interesting so it keeps me going the work-life balance for me is pretty good i would say uh i think the company actually matters more than a field sometimes so I have colleagues that work at other pharma, like J and J, for example, that may that have slightly worse work-life balance than I do, because GSK is a is a UK-based, Europe-based company. They generally kind of respect the when you're off work, you're off work. You should, people need time to recharge a little bit more than here for like more American companies, which has pros and cons. Um, so I'm very fortunate that people don't expect to respond to email five minutes after you get it. So I would say work-life balance overall, kind of a nine-to-five job. And except when deadlines and then you're working 24 hours a day for like a week straight. But other than that, pretty good. Um, for FDA, I would say uh, work-life balance is okay for the most part. I think, like I said, you have to juggle a lot of um, deadlines at the same time and so you kind of have to manage your own timeline to try to figure out how to finish that work because you don't have a wiggle room in terms of changing that deadline. Um, but the really nice thing of working at FDA and government agencies in general, at least FDA in particular, though, um, we are really good at um, providing flexible work days. So um, usually, depending on how long you've worked at FDA, you get to work at least two or three days at home. Um, and so that's really helpful for people who have kids. I don't have a family yet, but I notice that people who have children find that really, really beneficial to be able to work from home and, you know, take care of kids, pick them up from school, drop them off to daycare, all those things. And so um, that at least um, has been really helpful to parents or newly parents um, when you really need that time home with your kids and before they go really off to school. Um, so that has been nice to really get those um, work from home days. And you do get a good amount of vacation days. It's just a matter of finding time to use them. I think that really has been my biggest struggle trying to find time to take off when you have all these deadlines coming up. And again, the deadlines don't move, so you still have to do the work even if you are trying to take off time on vacation. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I probably work 50, 60 hours a week as well. But again, it's, it's just priority and really managing your time. But it's not bad. So we have a next very interesting question from Divya. Going back in time, if you were to do application processes over again, what would you have done differently? I think I can I go know. first I, with this I one. I regret nothing. I regret nothing. Um, <laughs> so I actually spent a really long time prepping for case study interviews, which is the type of interview that you have to do. Um, for basically all consulting firms. So what that is, if you're not familiar with it, is you go into the room, there's your interviewer, and they ask you, you know, hey, like, here's this particular problem with, like, very little data. And what you have to do is, like, structure out how you would solve this particular problem. And then they kind of, like, feed you data, um, whether that be qualitative or quantitative. And then, you know, you have to do the analysis, the mental math to come to like a logical conclusion. I spent a long time prepping for those types of interviews. And I think that it was 
probably unnecessary the amount of time that I spent prepping because it's just like, you know, you guys are smart people, you're PhDs, you know how to solve a problem. I would just say like making sure that you're coming into the room and being really confident with your answers um, and just being able to, to solve things quickly is the most important thing. Other than that, no regrets. Um, I'm trying to think of what, yeah, if there were any specific things I would have done differently. I think something that maybe probably doesn't answer the question directly, but something I did do that I think helped a lot is that I sent my cover letters that I would send to different companies to lots of different people that I knew that had no science background. Um, because uh, sometimes the people that read that may not be, you know, PhD level, they may be HR that don't really fully understand, you know, if you go to technical and you describe your project, it's just like sometimes it's not helpful to the person that's first triaging and, and going through your, your application. So I had, you know, friends look at all of my application information, whether that's, you know, other PhD students or just completely friends that are not related at all in the sciences, just to get their point of view to make sure that what I was sending in as my first impression was going to be easily understood. And so maybe that's something um, you can look into as you apply for jobs. Okay, so we have a question from Natasha. Natasha, can you unmute yourself and go ahead with your question? Uh, sure. I was wondering if any of you or if you know of anybody that's in your same job had any like backlash from advisors or people uh, when you're telling them that you were not going into academia. Yeah, I don't, I don't think my uh, never happened. Yeah, I don't think my uh, PhD advisor was like per particularly thrilled, um, but he was very supportive. Right. Like I had spent a good amount of time uh, volunteering with this consulting group and applying to um, these jobs. So he in particular was really supportive. I've, I've heard of other PIs being upset about it, but I, I haven't really heard of anybody like actually taking action to like actively sabotage somebody who doesn't want to go into academia. Um, I don't know if, if anybody else has heard of that, but usually they, they, they get over it and they support you in the end. Yeah, my experience was similar to Erica's, where I'm sure my PI would have loved for me to go to academia, but didn't, and, you know, that's fine. And thankfully, I wasn't the first person in my lab not to go into academia, so I think he has just been disappointed before and it was going to be okay. Um, but, again, I, I don't know how much they can really do. I hope they wouldn't prevent you from graduating or something like that. I think that seems very extreme. Um, but yes, I think just giving them a heads up beforehand, you know, don't make them believe that you're going to academia and go get a postdoc or, you know, have an open conversation with them early on about what your career aspirations are and ask them for help. You know, if they say, I can't help you, then you say, okay, thanks. I'm just letting you know that's what I want to do. Um, don't make them believe that you want to go into academia and then tell them on graduation day that you're not going to do that. You know, those kinds of things obviously would not, would backfire, but otherwise I haven't heard of anyone really, um, having a backlash from their advisor. So now we have another question for Carl. What was your path to get into GlaxoSmithKline Pharma? Uh, I applied for the job, I got an interview, and I accepted the offer. And it was as simple as that. There was no recruiting events, there was none no networking, none of the fancy stuff. I just applied and that was it. I, I have to say. So, I mean, is there any uh, specific points one should keep in mind while applying for pharma? Yeah, I think as someone that's reviewed hundreds of resumes, the thing that frustrates me the most is when I read the cover letter and I look at the CV and resume, it's so much detail about they did and oh look like I showed these are all my publications and blah blah blah. I'm like I don't really care about this stuff, right? I just care about what are your skills, right? And why do you want this job? But the focus is like on how I pu publish a cell metabolism paper showing X, Y, and Z, right? Like I first yeah. want to discover a pathway. I'm like okay, whatever. So yeah, I think that's on, the on one that advice note, I have. 
Yeah. On, on that note, actually, on my resume, I didn't even list all of my publications. What um, is pretty common in consulting for PhDs going into consulting is you have a section for publications and then you just like put your like two one to two best looking publications and then in the title I put like publications two of five or whatever. Um, so but it's yeah not not super important to focus on that. They want to know what you're what you're going to bring to the company in terms of skills. Do we have another question yeah. from Annie? Uh, okay, go ahead, Bao. Yeah, you were saying. Oh no, I was. I didn't have anything new to add. I was just say, yeah. I think for, even for FDA, which is very science based, I think the the two advices you've gotten um, also hold for us. Let's move to our ne next question. So we have another question from Annie. What is the typical career trajectory in your field? And where did you find the job ads? Uh, it's easy for FDA job ads are just on usajobs.gov. Um, that's kind of the easy part for us. I think we do maybe sometimes advertise them in some journal, but I think usajobs is probably best bet. Yeah. Um, um, in terms of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Traje trajectory question next, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I think at FDA it's interesting because you can be a reviewer, so reviewer of files for like your whole life. There have been people who started there in their like 20s, 30s, and they're now in their 60s retiring. So they just stayed in that same position the entire way. They didn't really move up. They really gained a lot of knowledge and they became kind of the go-to person in terms of like historical knowledge for FDA. And so those are very valuable positions. So it's not a bad thing to just be a lifer at the FDA. Um, others, you know, you would spend a few years of reviewer, you become maybe a manager or a team lead or something like that. And then oftentimes people end up in industry. You know, once you have a regulatory knowledge on how the FDA functions and what the FDA asks for, there's a lot of companies outside, pharma companies that would be happy to have that kind of knowledge. So sometimes people just go outside, go into work in industry, and then sometimes they come back to FDA to kind of end their career at FDA as a reviewer now having industry knowledge. So there's lots of different possibilities um, as a reviewer within the FDA, either whether you want to stay here or um, go outside to get industry experience. Yeah, and so I'll start with the job ads question and then answer the trajectory question. Um, but in terms of finding the job ads, um, like the, so the company that I actually ended up at, I really didn't even know existed until they reached out to my consulting group and said, listen, like we're really interested in what you guys are doing. Um, we have the summer program for PhDs. Would anybody be um, interested in attending that? So that if, if you are interested in Charles River Associates uh, in particular, we do have a summer program for PhDs where you come um, and spend a couple days with us. And I've been told that that is like, go, like the primary way in which they are going to hire uh, people in the future. That would almost be like PhDs, like first rounds um, at the company. Um, but in terms of other companies, I actually <laughs> crashed a lot of undergraduate career fairs. Um, and I'm like, hey, I know I'm not your typical uh, student here, but I'm wondering, you know, does this consulting group have a need for life sciences uh, consultants? And a lot of them did. Uh, so that was pretty useful. Um, Washington University also had like kind of a secret little portal in which you like, so first you submit your application on uh, the actual company's website and then you submit like a secondary uh, application through WashU's portal. So they make sure that you're going to, you know, a school like WashU or whatever, right? It's a very consulting thing. Um, so that's kind of like where I found all the job ads. Otherwise, they're just they're they're really they're just listed on the website, and they have um, firm annual deadlines, as I mentioned before. Um, and then the typical career trajectory, um, kind of like Val said, there are there are lifers, and then there are people that use it as um, a way to just have a crash course in pharma um, as well as the biotech industry, right? So. Um, some people will stay and like work their way up to principal and you're managing like a large group of people and you're interfacing with clients a lot like that job is basically just about building relationships with your clients um, and, and like making sure that they trust you with their work. Um, but then other people stay and it's like completely reasonable for other people to stay for a few years. You, you network at all of these different companies. As I mentioned, I'm working on like three to four different projects at a time. So 
um, I'm, I'm like really getting a good breadth of what's going on um, at all of these different companies. Um, and so like a lot of people will go and they'll work in pharma next. What's your opinion on this call? Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah we can, uh -oh. we can now, yeah. Okay, so for me to build career directory, I mean, obviously you become a director, you can become a VP, and obviously if it's a science track, you're gonna stay, you're just gonna have more and more leadership, right? Right. But you can also jump departments. There's a lot of colleagues I have that started science now they're in business development. I might actually be one of those people pretty soon. Um, and there are also people that left GSK and went to a venture capital firm. Actually, the former VP, VPR department did that. So you can do whatever you want pretty much. There's, no, there's almost nothing typical aside from just getting promoted up the ranks and becoming a scientist with more leadership over, over like other little scientists, I guess. And then where I found the jobs, I applied online, but I do know that we've been stalking people on LinkedIn a lot and shooting out LinkedIn messages because we're desperate to hire people right now. Because so, we're, we're actually the desperate ones. Um, and then I'm looking at the, the questions, what skills stand out? So like I mentioned, coding, quantitative skills, for us, strong genetics knowledge. You don't have to necessarily understand pharma that well. And I've never, seen anyone in my company or department that I that went back to academia. Right. Yeah, I think, um, oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it, so in terms of job, uh, skills that stand out on the job application, I think it's almost just like more of a process of like putting together the application in like a really structured and logical way, right? You can tell when somebody is just gonna like kind of be all over the place when they come um, and work on what is supposed to be like a really highly organized, highly structured project just by the way that they kind of structure their resume. So I'm not even really convinced that the content matters way too much um, just in terms of like the way that, that you present um, your resume and your cover letter is really important too because they want to see that you have really strong communication skills. That's going to be really important when you're interfacing with clients. Um, and then, yeah, nobody's ever gone back into academia. I've been, like nobody's ever even wanted to as far as I'm aware. Um, so Maggie's question, what types of skills stand out on an application? Um, Again, because all PhD resumes are probably all going to look the same to some extent, right? You got a PhD, you published some papers, you did some presentations, great. Like everyone's kind of looks the same. So it's hard to distinguish on that. Um, FDA does hire based on like your expertise. So, you know, if we need a microbiologist, obviously we'll be looking at the microbiologist coming in. Um, but again, like I said, um, and like Erica said, the cover letter, just really being able to Im express why you want to work at the FDA very briefly explain what your background is and what your skills are and what you can bring to the table. So that's why that cover letter does make a good first impression to really make you stand out from some of the other applications because again, your resume, your CV is most likely going to look very similar to everyone else applying. Um, and so that it's hard to have like one specific skill, but I think just the overall package being very clear in your cover letter will, will be a good first step. Um, in terms of people going back to academia, Actually, there's one in FDA. So we do have researchers at FDA, right? They're, they're labs, they're PIs, they have um, research fellows. And there was one guy who had worked there probably for like five years as a research fellow. And he was interested still in academia and he actually got a PI tenure position. So he left FDA to go be a professor. And so probably the only one that I've ever heard of, probably not very common, more likely people are leaving for industry jobs if they leave um, the FDA. Well, and then the next question is finding a job in a big city or living anywhere. Um, so for consulting, I think like most of the firms uh, are located in big cities. I'm actually in New York City right now in my tiny quarantine department. I thought it would be so cool to move to New York City and that j jokes on me now, right? So uh, <laughs> 
Uh, but yeah, so like most of the um, consulting firms are kind of like headquartered in um, major metropolitan areas. Um, but after a while, so like after you kind of like spend a couple of years within a regional office and network and, you know, show that you're a really invaluable part of the company, people regularly move to just like the middle of nowhere because they want to. Um, because really, like, so for example, the team that I work most closely with, um, one individual is in Boston, my boss lives in Austin, Texas, and then my boss's boss lives in Denver, right? And like, we're just, we're working together really seamlessly all the time. Um, so once you develop those internal networks, like it's completely fine for, for people to move just literally wherever they want to move. As long as it's close to an airport, right? You don't want to be spending several hours uh, all the time driving to an airport, but it's very flexible. Living in a big city doesn't really give you an advantage, right? A lot of the pharma companies are not like in Manhattan, right? They'll be like an hour and a half or two hours outside or in Jersey. So it doesn't really matter, I would say, for, for at least what, what, what I do. Um, I, as far as working online, like, it depends, right? If you're a scientist that works at a bench or manage a team of bench scientists, you probably need to be in more. And in addition, I would say that we do have some people that are 100% remote, like one guy lives in Orlando and the other person lives in San Diego, but that's because they're like that good. Like they pretty much, we gave them the job and they said, I only take the job in Orlando. And I'm like, fine, because, because they're that good. So if you're really, really good, I think you can pretty much do whatever you want and the company will have to accommodate you. That's, that's a nice job to have, I guess. <laughs> we always do that. At FDA, obviously, we are headquartered in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside of D.C., so you don't really have a lot of options as to whether or not you want to move here. Um, they are, FDA does have, like, smaller regional offices. They don't do any re review work, so you wouldn't be part of their regulatory process that we do, like, inspections for all of the different sites. So if you are into, interested in that kind of work, then they are located in, I don't know, I think like 20 out of the 50 states, we have local FDA offices just for inspections. Um, so that is an option if you want to work for the government but want to stay in the area that you're currently in. Um, it's very rare that we have people that are 100% remote. We have some medical officers like doctors, again, because they have very specific expertise that we need and they cannot move here because they have offices somewhere else. And so we are flexible for them, but most likely, um, if you want to do review work, you would have to be at headquarters in Maryland. Now we have next question from Natasha. Do you know of any resources where people can get advice for resume writing, interviewing, etc.? Um, I'm trying to think if I know anything specific. I think Poly University has a lot of resources for that. At least that's where I went when I was going through this process. Um, and again, for the resume, I kind of just send it around to my friends. I just said, hey, does this look good? And people have all sorts of different opinions of what it should look like and what it should sound like, but you get an overall idea of what would look good to a lay person at least. For interviewing, um, again, I think University of Maryland has some good resources for interview skills. You could go to some workshops. Um, I'll have to get back to you if I can think of anything outside of the university, res uh, university resources. Yeah, I think similar to about I really tapped into the university resources. Um, there was like a resume writing center um, at the university. I went to that several times to sort of polish everything up, but to start my initial resume writing since I really hadn't done it before, I reached out to one of my friends who was at a consulting firm and I'm like, would you be comfortable sharing your resume with me? It obviously worked for you, right? So I used that as a template um, to build mine out um, and that was, super helpful. Um, it's a, that's a hard thing to start from scratch. So I would definitely get a, uh, an example from somebody that you trust. Um, interviewing. Uh, so for consulting in particular, there's this kind of terrible, but maybe a little bit necessary book called Case in Point that everybody reads to prepare um, for, for case interviews because you, you do really need to prepare for those. Um, and then also there's like a listen over my shoulder, like audio series that I thought was um, pretty pretty useful as well. And then for life sciences consulting, if you go to the different life sciences consulting firm websites, uh, oftentimes they'll share 
um, specific resources for, you know, what is it like to solve a life sciences case? Because it is a little different, right? You have to consider um, problems that are specific to pharma rather than just general problems. Yeah, I just sent it to all my, my friends, and that was it. I trusted them. They, they, my friends don't do me wrong. Um, and as far as what does, next one, what does your job function, what does a typical day look like for you? Um, today's pretty slow because it's a holiday in the UK. So this is actually like the, the busiest time of my day right now, which is pretty sweet. Um, but normally it, it is kind of nine to five-ish. Um, lots and lots of meetings, unfortunately. And since I still am like pretty hardcore scientist, I'm trying to not, not do this, but I have like one or two to do real science. So I was, you're breaking up a lot, Carl. <clears throat> all right, I'll try to fix my connection. Someone else can go next. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think I gave like a little uh, taste as to what my day looks like. Um, but like I said, usually get to the office around. Well, when we're going to the office now, it's like I roll out of my bed onto my couch at like eight. Um, and then basically it's a lot of like managing emails and requests coming in from clients. Um, um, definitely a lot of meetings too. So I would say like a, like a good portion of my nine to five is filled with meetings. And then a lot of the work happens outside of the nine to five hours. Um, so yeah, other than that, it's just, it's a lot of like making really uh, high quality like slides for clients. Like we don't actually write out like text document reports. Our reports come in the form of a PowerPoint. So all the information needs to be like really represented clearly in those PowerPoints. And as I mentioned, I'm in like the market research team. Um, so a lot of my day encompasses like managing recruiters. So we have different um, recruiters who will contact physicians and then I have to manage moderators too, who sort of moderate those interviews. And then I like take all of that data, synthesize it and, and put it into those client presentations. So that's a, a very brief overview of, of what my day to day looks like. Mine is probably somewhat similar in that, um, yeah, I get to the office between like eight and nine. I, we have lots of meetings as well. And so the way, um, at least how my group divides up the work, you know, I do uh, the review of all the manufacturing of a specific product. So sell your product, how is it cultured, how is it um, packaged, how is it shipped? And then we have a whole team that just does the preclinical reviews, the animal data that a, that a company may have done to look at how the drug works in an animal. And then we have a whole clinical team and they look at how, uh, you know, these studies will be translated into a human study. And so all these three disciplines do need to meet frequently to kind of get a sense of where the other discipline feels the submission is. Um, do we have any issues? So there's a lot of meetings, discuss files, and then we have, I spend a lot of time on my computer reading, obviously, the submission and then sending questions to the company to say, hey, you, you said you're culturing it for this time amount. It doesn't really make sense. Can you send me some more information? I need some more protocols. I need additional information. So a lot of back and forth with the companies themselves. And so there's a lot of emails, a lot of meetings. So I'm on the computer for most of the day in some shape or form. Um, but all of our writing, I'm like what Erica is saying that she's all of her deliverables are in PowerPoint presentations, all of our deliverables are in written documents. So lots of memos um, to really write down our analysis of a submission from a company, you know, what are the pros and cons, what have we seen that, that works, what does not work, what do we have problems with? And so yeah, our deliverables are all in written documents. So now we have a very interesting question from Natasha. How have you kept up with the science and research train after leaving academia? I can kind of go first because it's super easy for FDA. You know, I get that the newest trends and, you know, the newest innovative science comes to me, which is really nice. I don't, you know, I read articles that are relative to that field, but um, if anyone wants to come get things to market and where they're close to that, they come to us and they kind of show us um, what they've been working on. And through that kind of review, I read um, and get to uh, make sure I'm up to speed with the newest research and other, other, any other trends that are happening in academia. 
Yeah, I would say I don't have a ton of time to just like kind of casually browse uh, what's going on in this in the science field in general. Uh, but my company does a really good job of providing us multiple resources to just stay up to date with what we um, need to to be paying attention to. Um, so one of those uh, mediums is through um, like internal publications that we have. So um, like more junior members will work with more senior experienced members to write these like summary articles of like important, interesting trends for our company. And they'll, also, they'll, they'll often post um, links to those articles on LinkedIn or on, so, on their social media pages. And so um, if I'm browsing Facebook and I know I should be working, I'll see one of those articles and it'll remind me that I should probably read that. Um, but then also my, the particular, the New York City office has a bi-weekly meeting where um, a portion of that meeting is dedicated to um, someone in the office choosing a pharma article that they think is is really interesting, like a news update from a pharma company that they think is interesting and presenting that during the meeting. So that's been really helpful too. Do I sound a little bit better now? Yeah, a lot better. Okay. Um, so keeping up in science for me is actually part of my job. So, I mean, I've published a few papers since I've been at GSK. I attend as many conferences as I can with my team. It's actually really fun because we divide and conquer and try to get as much information. And also we, in a way, at least for genetics at GSK, I mean, we're trendsetters, right? And we're, we're the ones with the collaboration of 23 me. So for us, it's like we're the ones leading. I don't need to keep up with things, right? Other people are more coming to us about that. But that's just for my field specifically. And then as, just looking at the next question, as far as uh, when applying for jobs, how true is that there's overqualified PhD candidates? That doesn't happen for our job. If, if, a, if we think someone applied for a position that was too low, when we make them an offer or, some, or something like that, we'll actually give them the higher level, right? Because by the time we make an offer, we actually want that person. So I don't care if it's gonna take an extra 20, 30 grand, right, to get someone here. That's, that's small money, right, to get a quality person. So we'll just give someone the next level up, at least here. Yeah, that's uh, similar to consulting. So there are, it, it's very high, hierarchical. Um, so undergraduates will come in at the analyst level, people with masters will come in at the associate level, and then people with PhDs will come in at the consulting associate level. So if somebody applies to the wrong position through the portal on the website, we'll, uh, and we see that they have a PhD, we'll kick them up to the consulting associate um, position. So definitely not a concern of overqualification. Yeah, very similar in the government. We have a very clear GS scale. Um, it's very clearly laid out depending on what your um, educational background is. You get into a certain level and if you have additional work experience on top of that, you get kicked up with level, et cetera. So <clears throat> it's very hard to be overqualified technically for the job, especially in the sciences at, at FDA. Um, but I will say when I was um, pursuing that policy position in California and I had the option to stay on there for um, a, a different position in California doing policy, um, the policy world is now just starting to kind of appreciate PhD scientists and so they have not really caught up yet with the amount of knowledge and skills that we bring to the table and compensate <laughs> us for that um, appropriately. So. The offers I was getting in California for a policy position were probably not as great um, money-wise uh, compared to the government position I was getting here at FDA, just because they're just not familiar. They work with a lot of, you know, poli sci majors, English majors, lawyers, et cetera. So they are way more familiar with that world um, in terms of payment and salary than they would be for a PhD scientist. So there, there was definitely some negotiations that had to happen because I said. Um, you know, I'm worth a little bit more than what you think. I know you think I'm just like an early scientist, but I do have something to offer. And, and that's a uh, an area within policy that's really needed, is, you know, more scientists. And so <clears throat> um, you do kind of have to, if you don't negotiate, you could be in a position like that where you could be overqualified and underpaid um, for a position like that. But um, definitely not in the federal government here in D.C. Do we have another question from Natasha here? Is social media important for your job? If it is, how important it is? I think it's probably more important for other people's positions within the company. Um, I, Like I said, I kind of just like casually 
uh, browse LinkedIn to see uh, what's going on in the field and to, to catch my company's uh, insights. But other than that, I, I would say not particularly important. The, the major thing for me is I can't post things that I used to post on my on my own social media now that I'm representing the company and they train you to do that. So I, I can't be an internet troll anymore. I actually have to keep my face up pretty clean. Um, but that's part of trying to be more quote unquote professional. Yeah, I uh, before I applied to consulting firms, I deleted a lot of pictures from high school. So uh, it is important to be to keep your social media um, really clean. And now that I think about it, we have had a few social media trainings. Um, but I think those are more for people who are working their way up to like more client facing positions where um, you connect with clients on LinkedIn and then you are supposed to act as a source of um, the latest news within the field, right? So your clients will actually be looking at, at your news feed very regularly for useful information. But at my level, it's not super important. Yeah, same with me. They don't actually want you on social media representing FDA in any way. So don't, we, sh we can't try to even post anything um, that is related to FDA, really. Um, so obviously, FDA has its own social media, and that's really important in times like these, for example, just to put out accurate, factual information. But personally, um, they try to get all the workers to really not uh, be involved and post anything that could be misused as, as being from FDA just because we work here. I think most of the questions are addressed here, but is there anything we are living, leaving out and that you all think needs to be addressed? Um, there's one thing that I'll mention, and, and so I know I've been talking a lot about FDA because that's just where I am currently at, but um, my eventual hopeful job trajectory is to, to work up my way at FDA to be a more policy-oriented person at FDA and, and do more policy-related things. And so I think in this time um, where people are deciding where to go, I think science policy positions are becoming more and more, not popular, but well-known, and that's an option for scientists to go into. And like I said earlier, um, policy makers really need more scientists in the policy world to help make and write laws and policies that are factually based on science, et cetera. And so um, there are a lot more programs popping up that are related to science policy, specifically aimed at PhDs um, that want to jump into the policy field. And so the one I did was called um, CCST, so the California Council on Science, science and Technology. Um, <clears throat> I can talk ad nauseum at that, about that program because I loved it and it was fantastic and I recommend anyone who is at all, at all interested in policy to try out that program and I can send out more links and stuff um, for that and they have a great resource for people who are interested in policy. They have a whole booklet on you know different people who have done policy work and our PhD um, in, in background. Uh, the, the program is called CCST, California Council on Science and Technology. <clears throat> Um, so I would just say, you know, as you are navigating your world through the PhD and ending it and figuring out what you want to do next, if science policy at all is at all sounding interesting to you, feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. And FDA, I think to me, is one great way of combining that scientific knowledge that you're gaining now as a PhD student, um, using that while also kind of you know exploring the world of policy because FDA is all based on policies we, we write our own policies etc and so if you can if you want to merge your scientific knowledge with your interest in policy I think FDA is a, is a wonderful place to be at. Yeah one thing oh, I would say. Yes Annie. Oh sorry I was I saw Annie's um about that program as well, and that's also a really great um, policy program with the National Institute of Sciences. National Academy of Sciences, sorry. Yes, that one is a good one too. The one thing that I would just like to add is when you're thinking about, when you're in a, selecting your job and ready to make a decision, company culture is really, really important. Because I've, on my interviews, and also I have former colleagues I've jumped around, it doesn't always matter kind of how shiny the position looks or how much they're paying you. If you're in a really toxic toxic environment, you're going to hate your job really quickly. So keep that in consideration. Are people there happy, right? Talk, kind of 
ask questions not just about the work, but like their life and how how do managers treat their direct reports? So just, I cannot emphasize that enough. I, I've heard many horror stories and luckily I haven't encountered any, but my friends have of just their lives being ruined by a terrible manager. So just be careful. Yeah, uh, definitely the same uh, for consulting. There are some firms that will pay you a lot of money and that looks really nice on paper, but when you get there, they're, they're working you as they would two people. Um, so you need to really talk to the employees, you know, are they having a good time there? I think one of the um, cultural aspects of my company that I liked a lot was that they really kind of just advertise themselves as like a nerdy consulting firm full of PhDs. Um, so you definitely feel like you fit in. Um, and, and you'll know when you talk to people at a particular company if this is going to be the right fit for you, if you're asking the right questions. Okay, so I, I think we have one more question here. What is the consulting company you work at? Yeah, it's Charles River Associates. I'll go ahead and type that here is um with my email as well and people also ask for your email so it would be good if we can provide your email there i think now we are getting close to the end of our time together so if there is one thing you would like uh, the students and trainees to take away from this session what would it be if you see something that you like if you see a job posting that you like go for it don't second guess yourself um try to go into the process really confidently right you're you're a phd uh well or at least almost a phd right you're a competent problem solver and and go into this process with that particular attitude yeah don't undersell yourself that that's that's the key thing i think you know they, they say that generally the smarter you are the more you undersell yourself. And usually the people that speak the loudest, I think they're awesome are the people that are not as smart. So we're all really smart, right? Don't undersell yourself. Sometimes we're too, we second guess ourselves too much. Especially when you're competing with the, the business school folk, right? They're trained to sell themselves very well, right? So PhDs need to come in with that same uh, confident and, and uh, competent attitude. Yeah, I definitely echo all of that. I think um, we are trained to think that we're not experts because you always have someone who knows more about you and the tiny field of research that you've done and just realize that you are an expert in whatever field you're studying. There's very few people who know more about the topic than you. Probably you already know the most because you wrote a thesis on that whole topic. So just remember that, being confident, knowing that you are an expert in your field and you have a lot to offer in terms of problem solving, really thinking outside the box. That is what your whole PhD was about fixing problems, troubleshooting, that is such a valuable skill. And so, um, like Eric and Carl said, like, do not undersell yourself. You're mm -hmm. very valuable in a lot of different ways. And you just have to bring that across uh, in your interviews and in your uh, job applications. So, best of luck. You've got this.